not quite like any other town in America, was once one of the most vital centers of the whole Southeast. During the Civil War, it was Northern Territory. And yet it's the southernmost town in the continental United States. And the people who were born here are called Conks. This is the end of the road going south. And we'll find out more about it today as Discovery goes to Key West. Discovery 70, the award-winning program for young people with Bill Owen and Virginia Gibson. Hi, and welcome to Discovery. Here in Key West, Florida, a highway ends which started way up in Fort Kent, Maine. It begins in snow and pine trees and finishes in sunshine and palms. In itself, it's a kind of symbol of the diversity of this country, any way you travel it. U.S. Highway Number 1, if you travel south, heads like a concrete arrow for a dead end here in Key West. It's one of the liveliest dead ends you can imagine. On a small island, which for a while was the richest city per capita in the entire country. The highway started life as a railroad. It connected Key West with the southern tip of Florida's mainland. It was called the railroad that went to sea. During the eight years of its construction, 4,000 men withstood the turbulence of three hurricanes and the heat of broiling summers to complete the job. They used the most sophisticated engineering equipment then available, floating cranes and derricks, snag boats and pile drivers. Henry Flagler, the man who inaugurated the project, wanted one day to take it all the way to Cuba, but he died shortly after its opening. The motive behind this $35 million venture was to establish an inexpensive trade route to Cuba, a country whose recent independence from Spain opened up many commercial possibilities to the United States. The Spanish fleet sailed near Key West, carrying Inca gold back to Spain. It was for this reason that pirates like Black Caesar and Henry Morgan found Key West a logical base of operations. They preyed on sunken ships and on ships that ran aground in shallow waters. In the early 1800s, one aspect of piracy became a legal and lucrative occupation. It was called wrecking and consisted primarily of salvaging the cargo from shipwrecks and auctioning it off through the court in Key West. When lighthouses were built in the 1850s, ships could navigate safely past the treacherous reefs. This meant the end of a large source of income for the island. John Simonton purchased Key West privately from a Spaniard in 1822. He and three other men built the town, taking advantage of the natural harbor. It drew people experienced with the sea from Europe and the British West Indies and began to take on a style of life that was unique. Homes were most often built of cypress or Madeira mahogany, the materials that could best withstand violent storms. In spite of two major fires and countless hurricanes since its earliest days, many homes have held out and others have been built. One of the most significant structures that has enhanced the atmosphere of nautical life here is a naval station, first placed here in 1823 to help disperse the pirates in the area. It was because of the presence of the military that Key West was considered Northern Territory during the Civil War. As with most island communities, fishing as a sport and as an industry is very important. Especially significant are the numerous shrimp, or pink gold as they're called, which flourish and breed off the reefs near the Keys. Hundreds of trawlers base themselves in the island harbor. Each one will spend from one to 10 days and nights per trip at sea, scooping shrimp off the sea floor with large black nets. When a boat returns, its catch is unloaded, packaged, and shipped to all parts of the country. Since 
Since shrimp is one of the most numerous animals in the sea, shrimping is likely to remain an important activity here. Equally busy are the lobstermen who find nearby waters abundant with Florida lobster. Florida lobsters are not as large as their cousins from Maine and are more closely related to crayfish, but the method of catching them in traps is still the same. Sportsmen try their hand at catching one or more of the 360 species of saltwater fish found nearby. Charter boats go out daily to stalk giant marlin, tarpon, sailfish, and smaller varieties such as mackerel, dolphin, and amberjack. And sometimes the deep sea offers up its most feared inhabitant, the shark. Fishermen comprise an important segment of the tourists who come here. Other tourists come just to enjoy the climate and the sightsee. This unique train helps them do it comfortably. It's called the conch train. It takes its name from a huge edible member of the snail family. Conch is also a term that applies to anyone born in this area. In less than two hours, this train can circle the whole island, showing tourists all of the island's attractions and historical sites. One of them being an unusual fortification constructed during the Civil War to protect the island's naval installation. This is Martello Tower, the latest word in the 19th century in massive bastion building. But the greatest fortress of all is 75 miles out at sea. It rings even now with one of the saddest, harshest stories of the Civil War. We'll go there and find islands named after turtles and a fortress from which a shot was never fired. We'll do that in just a minute. We're about 70 miles southwest of Key West in a group of islands called the Dry Tortugas Tortuga means turtle in Spanish, and the islands were named by Ponce de Leon, who found large numbers of sea turtles on the beaches. The word dry was added later by seafaring men who found no fresh water on the islands. One of the dry tortugas, called Garden Key, contains a national monument, Fort Jefferson. Long before the Civil War, as early as 1825 in fact, there had been construction here. And when the war came along, there was a master plan for coastal defense from Maine to Mississippi and Fort Jefferson was an important part of it. No ship attempting to enter the Gulf of Mexico through navigable waters could pass without being seen from the fort. The fort's long-range cannon made major southern ports on the Gulf inaccessible to unauthorized vessels. There were to be 450 guns here and a contingent of 1,500 men to operate them. It was to be the largest fort in the entire coastal defense system. Fort Jefferson was an astounding job of submarine engineering, the most ambitious project attempted up to that time by the Corps of United States Engineers. Foundations two feet thick and 14 feet wide had to be built under the surface of the water because the six-sided fort actually extended farther into the sea than the island at some points. Many of the craftsmen and a lot of the white labor came from the north. A lot of them were Irish because it was coincident with the period of the first great wave of Irish immigration after the Irish famine of 1850. The slaves came from Key West slave owners, and slaves worked at Fort Jefferson until emancipation in 1863. Men worked 10 hours a day, six days a week, but one officer complained that because of the heat, it took two men to do the work of one. In a corner of the parade ground, this hot shot furnace was constructed. Inside, solid round shot were heated cherry red to be fired from cannon as incendiary projectiles. A shot held enough heat to set fire to a wooden ship even after several ricochets over the water. 
as with so many other things constructed in the 1840s, 50s, and 60s, much of the work here was done by slave labor. It never was easy, and the project wasn't a lucky one. By 1857, cracks started developing in the walls, and two years later, in 1859, some walls had sunk as much as a foot. All food, except what could be fished out of the Gulf, had to be shipped in. A few hogs and a few head of cattle were barely kept alive in the fort on dry forage. If he were lucky, a man might get two issues of meat a week. There were many complaints. One man wrote, subsistence was horrible. The bread was a mixture of flour, bugs, sticks, and dirt. Meat was rotten to such an extent that dogs ran from it. No vegetable diet, and the coffee was made into a slop by those who had charge of the cookhouse. Of the 450 big guns planned for the fort, none was in place when the Civil War began. Soon enough, 68 were mounted, and eventually 141. But over in Europe, a new kind of cannon had been developed, and it would make Fort Jefferson obsolete. Rifled cannon had been invented, and it proved able to breach eight-foot-thick masonry walls. Forts like Fort Jefferson were finished. During the Civil War, Fort Jefferson was used as a prison. A soldier named Harrison Herrick, a sergeant in the 110th New York Volunteers, kept a diary covering part of the time he served here in 1864 and 1865. A few excerpts from it give us an idea of what it must have been like to have been stationed here. March 27th, went up to the parish prison to get 68 prisoners. On the 30th, got in sight of Tortugas about 10 a.m. Went ashore with prisoners and all in small boats about 4 p.m. Fort Jefferson, March 31st. Kept myself busy all day getting my things to right. Went on dress parade in the evening. After that, took a walk around the fort. Weather pleasant. Saturday, April 9th. No drill all day. The boys had the whole day to devote to cleaning up their equipments. I spent the whole day fixing up my knapsack and cleaning my gun. Thursday, May 5th, the Thames arrived from Fort Delaware with 280 prisoners. It was noised about the fort that the prisoners were planning an escape. Detailed a double guard. Wednesday, the 18th, the schooner came in with beef cattle. I got a letter from mother and wrote one to her. April, Thursday, the 20th. The steamer Corinthian came in from Key West and brought the news that General Lee and his whole army was captured. At 2 p.m. there was a brass band came ashore and played. They commenced to fire a salute of 200 guns in honor of the victory. That was probably the only time these guns were ever fired, except maybe in practice. During the Civil War, there were as many as 800 prisoners on this small island. Most of them were former Union soldiers, deserters sentenced to hard labor, which was, of course, the labor of trying to finish the construction of this fort. The prisoners were available because in 1864, President Lincoln had commuted the death sentence for deserters to imprisonment in the Dry Tortugas. Abraham Lincoln's assassination, four of the conspirators were imprisoned at Fort Jefferson, along with a country doctor who had unwittingly set the fractured leg of Lincoln's murderer. John Wilkes Booth, the assassin, had broken his leg during his escape and went in disguise for treatment to Dr. Samuel A. Mudd. The doctor, unaware of the crime, sheltered him for a few hours. Dr. Mudd was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor. He was pardoned in 1869, but he had spent four years in prison at Fort Jefferson. A yellow fever epidemic added to the fort's problems in 1867, and over the years, with defense theories changing, it fell into disuse and decay. In 1935, it became a part of the National Park Service, as it is today. Its stories locked into its mortar and its bricks. Meanwhile, Key West became famous for the quality of its life, its sport, and the men and women who came to live there. 
We'll find out more about that in just a minute. The precise character of a place is determined in part by the nature of the people who come there and the things they do. Over the years, Key West has drawn a wide range of individuals who came here to live and work. The great bird painter, John James Audubon, didn't live here very long, but he did stay long enough to do some of his finest work. Audubon lived and worked here in 1832 and completed many of his famous paintings of birds. Key West seems to have been the kind of place that other artists find peaceful enough to be able to work without distraction. Mario Sanchez was born in Key West, and his colorful painted woodcuts are popular with island residents and visitors. Recollections of his childhood experiences and memories provide the subjects for his works. By using simple instruments, mallet, chisel, a piece of jagged glass, he cuts vivid scenes of Key West's past into a cedar plank. When I sketch something, uh, that's what I like. You know, I don't like uh, somebody to come and tell me, do this and do that. Uh, I like to sit down nights and I sketch, uh, I, I get the wood and prepare it and glue it uh, together. And then when I have them prepared and glued and everything, I. I get my sketch and trace it on the uh, wood, and then I start working. As you chip, uh, you chip and chip and give it the dimension, see? You have to have the uh, street, sidewalk, the uh, garden, and, and the house in the back, and the sky and the clouds. As you work along, you, you get the dimension by uh, cutting in the wood. And when I have it uh, the way I want it, I stop and then I start painting. I um, started doing this uh, ever since I was a boy. I'm a good observer. I go around and observe. I like to observe things. Among his favorite subjects are the colorful funerals that were of a style rarely seen today. They uh, march in the uh, funeral procession dressed up in their large uh, uniforms. They used to have a big band, and the music they play uh, is kind of sad, uh, funeral marches, you know. Um, a couple of Sundays ago, I saw a funeral right here, and went on Truman Avenue there. I, I think they only have uh, six or seven musicians now. I, I guess the uh, younger boys don't go for that now. Hmm? People uh, came from over from Cuba, and every uh, Christmas Eve they used to dance and dress up in those uh, feathery suits and all that, and they used to play the bongos and drums and, and dance. People used to watch. We used to have uh, goats and carts and go to the grocery and do errands for my mother and my grandmother. In every block. Uh, the kids used to have uh, goats and carts. They trained them, you know, like a horse. And we used to run around with the carts and goats. My father, he used to read uh, for about uh, a thousand cigar makers. He used to read out loud to educate them and entertain them too at the same time. He used to have to be a, an actor. You know, if you had to talk like a woman, you had to talk like a woman and like the old man and, and all of that. He used to act to give it the right meaning. It was just like an education to the cigar makers. Key West used to be the cigar capital of the world. In the period between 1870 and 1890, no place else could match Key West for quality and productivity. Today, there's just this one little shop, kept open as a kind of working museum. 
The little factories where the cigars were made in those vanished days were called Buckeyes. Some of the Buckeyes still stand, like this one. But the industry has gone, victim of industrialization, competition, and labor problems. The men working here remember the days of the large factories. They've been cigar makers in Key West for over 60 years. Blacks and whites, Cubans and Anglos, the soft speech of the American South blending with Spanish with a Havana accent. It's all part of life on an American island unlike any place on the mainland. Key West is rich and odd, interesting and diverse. Since cities and islands owe their present to their past, we can give thanks for this little key's compelling present to the pirates and the writers, the wreckers and the artists, the refugees and the runaways who populated it in the years that are gone. We'll be back in just a minute. We hope you've enjoyed our visit to Key West, Florida. If you'd like to find out more about Key West and its colorful history, then ask your librarian for these books. Florida by Alan Carpenter, Buccaneers and Pirates of Our Coasts by Frank R. Stockton. Be sure to be with us next week for another exciting adventure as Discovery continues to discover the world. Bye-bye. Bye. The Discovery Production Unit's domestic transportation and promotional consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News.